this lecture is going to take you through heart failure and shock. Before I actually start discussing heart failure, let me remind you that you are supposed to have acquired the article Heart Failure Pathophysiologic Mechanisms uh, from the, what is it, the American Journal of Nursing. Uh, please be sure that you do get that article and read through it. Um, it gives you a good uh, summary of what actually is heart failure, um, goes through what changes or ventricular remodeling can occur in heart failure, and then it gives uh, definitions for systolic heart failure and diastolic heart failure, which is the first one we're going to go through here. Um, and then its focus specifically is going to be on the effects of neuro neurohormonal responses, in other words, what happens with sympathetic stimulation, the angiotensin aldosterone activation, um, the effects of ADH, and then what they call the good guys, the natriuretic peptides, the AMP and BNPs, and how they actually improve cardiac function. Keep in mind also that aside from the uh, neurohormones that are listed there, particularly, uh, again, aldosterone, angiotensin 2, epinephrine, and norepinephrine, um, the ADH, vasopressin, um, and they do also mention some endothelin and tumor necrosis factors. We don't spend too much time with those, but all those other hormones we've already talked about, definitely be aware of their functions and how they can have detrimental effects on the heart function and actually make heart failure worse. And then at the end of the article, it addresses some pharmacological connections. Um, those you do not need to know. So the medications that are, are mentioned are not um, required information that you need to know on that. Um, so just, just be aware that's going to be one of your primary sources. It does a nice job of kind of a little easier read on um, heart failure. Likewise, with shock, I'll mention it when we get to that here in just a second, but I provided on uh, the Moodle page um, an outline of information on shock. Uh, please use that as kind of a, a good guideline as you read through that material. Uh, so I will not lecture very heavily on shock uh, because you have that information really already provided for you. All right, let's take a look at heart failure. Uh, again, I've mentioned it a number of times already. Heart failure is not the same as myocardial infarction or cardiac arrest. Heart failure is a condition in which the heart fails to pump effectively and therefore affects overall tissue perfusion or the ability of blood to get to tissues. Uh, so heart failure is a condition that people live with, can be treated for, and often cannot be um, resolved in the, to the point that it can be cured, uh, but the conditions, the uh, problems that are occurring with it can often be lessened so that there can be some, uh, some normalcy return to cardiac function uh, with heart failure. All right, so the book breaks it down into several different categories. Again, the, the article really focuses on systolic and diastolic, but we can look at a couple of different versions. So starting with systolic, that is an impaired ejection of blood from the heart during systole or during contraction. And really, we're referring to ventricular contraction, so impaired ejection. What you have in systolic uh, failure, again, systolic is your contraction, diastolic is relaxation. So in systolic, you have a decrease in contractility and therefore a decrease in ejection fraction. Uh, in general, with systolic heart failure, there will be an increase in afterload. The pressure that must be exceeded uh, is going to be too great, and the heart cannot meet that. Um, there's a volume overload. Blood does not leave the heart. In systolic failure, the heart's not contracting effectively. It's not ejecting the blood effectively, and blood is going to start to back up into the left atrium and into the lungs. So, Causes of systolic uh, heart failure can be ischemic heart disease, anything that reduces blood flow, and so that's atherosclerosis in particular. Certainly cardiomyopathies can lead to systolic uh, heart failure, particularly dilate, uh, dilated cardiomy cardiomyopathy. Any kind of valve insufficiencies can cause heart failure. Uh, fail, it can be aortic stenosis. It can be mitral valve stenosis regurgitation. So uh, anything that uh, prevents the heart from properly ejecting blood uh, because it can't contract effectively is going to be uh, systolic 
heart failure, cause systolic heart failure. Hypertension can eventually lead to this, um, and even uh, valve stenosis. I mentioned valve insufficient valve disorders. Both the regurgitations and the stenosis can lead to uh, systolic failure. Manifestations are decreased ejection fraction. As I mentioned before, that means there's a decrease in stroke volume, and there therefore is also a decrease in cardiac output. Now, when you look at diastolic heart failure, that's the relaxation. What's not working there is the ability for the ventricles to fill. So, impaired filling of ventricles during relaxation. Now, ejection fraction and systole, the actual ability to contract, are not affected here. So, the heart will still contract. It will still eject blood and so the percentage of blood that's in there versus what go or the percent ejection fracture remember is the amount that gets out versus how much was in there to begin with so that percentage may not change because the heart can contract well well but what happens is you don't have enough blood in there to begin with so if you have or you needed to have a hundred milliliters in there um, and your ejection fraction was 75 percent well 75 milliliters would make it out that would be a good functioning uh, left ventricle but if you only have you know, 50 uh, milliliters in there, you still send out 75% of 50, so the contraction percentage is still the same, but the overall stroke volume is certainly diminished. Okay, so ejection fraction may not change because the heart's contracting well, but the total volume that was there to begin with is going to be diminished. Causes for diastolic favor, uh, failure would be mitral valve stenosis. Any kind of myocardial hypertrophy, which would anything that causes the myocardium to increase, so particularly hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Aging can be a problem because the elasticity of the cardiac muscle diminishes, so it doesn't stretch well enough. The preload certainly is going down here. Um, ischemic heart disease, and again, any kind of atherosclerosis that's blocking vessels can eventually lead to the inability for the cardiac muscles to function correctly, and they will not uh, relax and therefore uh, fill appropriately. Manifestations can, uh, can include systemic hypertension, and under exertion, there will certainly be tachycardia. This will further reduce filling time. All right, so that's, uh, syst uh, that's the systolic versus diastolic. Now, in the high output, low output, this was this kind of an odd type of heart failure. In high output, the heart is functioning, but the needs of the body are so excessive that it cannot be met. So... In high output, we st we, what the failure is, is the failure for the heart to meet those high output demands. So it's functioning, it's beating, but it's just not enough to meet the needs of the body. So the output's high, but not enough uh, to meet what's needed. Uh, certainly severe anemia can be one of the uh, t causes for high output failure. You're, with severe anemia, we're talking about either a lack of overall red blood cells or a lack of hemoglobin on there. Either way, oxygen delivery is severely diminished, and the body tries pumping more and more and more blood to try and meet the need, and it's not sufficient. Uh, thyrotoxicosis, which is also, re if you recall, thyroid storm. During thyroid storm, a high output heart failure will certainly develop. Um, and there's a thing called Paget's disease. Paget's disease is an abnormal breakdown and subsequent reformation of bone tissue, and it is linked to high output heart failure as well. Um, manifestations, uh, cardiac output is high in this case, but it is insufficient. Okay? So the manifestations of high output heart failure are, are eventually uh, that the heart will give way and you can even lead to cardiac arrest. So again, it's a heart it's an unusual heart failure. It's working, but eventually you can exhaust the heart muscle. And then you have low output um, heart failure. This is where the pumping ability of the heart is diminished overall. So it's not one side versus another. It's not just the contraction issue. Um, it's that you're simply not able. To, it's pumping, but the actual overall volume is diminished. So this one's kind of an overlap of some of the other types of heart failure. Uh, causes ischemic heart disease and cardiomyopathy. And in the manifestations, your EDV may go up because you have more blood coming into the heart, but the stroke volume and cardiac output will be diminished. So again, low output heart failure is kind of an unusual. The book 
addresses it, so I've placed it here. But really, some of the other diastolic heart failure, systolic heart failure, most of them can be linked to low output issues. And then you have the left-sided versus right-sided heart failure. And that's our next slide is going to look at the manifestations for this. You, in order to, for this to make sense, you've got to keep in mind that it is necessary for both the left side and the right side to be pumping equal amounts. So if one side starts pumping less than the other, it will eventually lead from, if the left side's not pumping out effectively, uh, that'll lead to left-sided heart failure, and eventually that'll lead back around and cause a problem with the right side, and, and the right side will fail. So left and right-sided heart failures have some unique manifestations depending upon which side is affected, but it's important to keep in mind that eventually it will affect the other side. So causes for right-sided heart failure are conditions that weaken the muscle and restrict blood flow to the lungs. So things that can do that, some kind of stenosis or regurgitation of the tricuspid or pulmonary valves. Now we really, in those valve disorders, we didn't look at the, left, at the right side of the heart at all, so we didn't mention a tricuspid regurgitation or stenosis or a pulmonary valve. That tends to be less frequently occurring, uh, and it, but certainly infections, those vegetative lesions we mentioned with myocarditis, or I'm sorry, endocarditis, could certainly be a problem here. Uh, so this can occur, it's just far less common. Uh, cardiomyopathies are more likely to head to right-sided heart failure. Um, and remember that if the left side fails, it can eventually lead to right-sided heart failure. Uh, causes for left-sided heart failure, acute uh, myocardial infarction, so uh, heart attack will do that, cardiomyopathies, and of course the valve defects can lead to that, mitral and aortic stenosis and regurgitation. All of them can lead to left-sided heart failure. Now for the manifestations, this is an excellent slide out of your book that can really uh, take you through what's happening with each of these problems. So if the right side fails, you have congestion, blood, blood backing up in peripheral tissues. So this went low, keep in mind it also can back up into the superior vena cava and will show up in, in a distension or bulging of the jugular veins. But it certainly can lead to edema, ascites, liver congestion, so now the liver doesn't function correctly, GI tract congestion, the blood vessels there, remember anorexia is lack of appetite, GI distress, weight loss, so it can include nausea and vomiting. All of that's linked to right-sided heart failure. In left-sided heart failure, we have the backing up into the pulmonary uh, veins, so called, we have pulmonary congestion that leads to pulmonary edema. So you'll see cough with frothy sputum. Uh, this is uh, paroxysm, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. is difficult, particularly at night when you're sleeping, the inability, painful or inability to breathe. Um, the impaired gas exchange is going to lead to hypoxic conditions. And certainly, um, in terms of decreased cardiac output, you're going to have issues of activity intolerance, signs of decreased tissue perfusion. You're not going to be able to deliver the oxygen to the tissues that you need. So this is an excellent slide to spend some time with so you understand what's going on there when you have lack of oxygen delivery. Um, likewise, let me just point out here, when you have a lack of oxygen delivery in the pulmonary, um, in, with pulmonary congestion, you're also going to have an increase in carbon dioxide levels. This is crucial to understand. You've got to go back to your issues of acidosis here, respiratory acidosis. If you cannot get rid of carbon dioxide, uh, if you cannot pick up oxygen and get oxygenated blood to deliver to the tissues, you also cannot get rid of carbon dioxide. So you will definitely fall into an acidotic state. And so in addition, you're going to have issues where you can't deliver oxygen to the peripheral tissues as well, nor can you pick up the carbon dioxide and you have acidosis developing from the peripheral tissues as well. So please keep that in mind. There's a linkage with heart failure and acidosis, particularly left-sided heart failure and that inability to get rid of carbon dioxide, whether it be at the lungs themselves or even picking it up as the blood flows by uh, in the peripheral tissues because it's already going to have an increased amount of carbon dioxide there as the blood continues to flow by. Uh, mechanisms for compensation for heart failure. 
Uh, keep in mind, uh, the article does a really good job with this. Uh, in heart failure, you have an increased sympathetic stimulation. You have the RAA pathway. All of those processes are linked to try and increase the contractility, increase the effects of the heart. But the article uh, rather well points out that this process of trying to increase uh, vascular volume and therefore increase the ability to pump more blood can actually lead to further complications with the heart failure. So you take a look at this is what sympathetic reflexes will do. They'll increase contractility, they'll increase heart rate, increase the constriction at the vessels, uh, the kidneys are going to get involved with the RAA pathway and angiotensin 2 which is the vasoconstrictor, aldosterone, we're going to retain sodium, more water is going to follow and our blood volume is going to go up. But if the heart already was struggling to maintain the blood volume was, that was there, this is just going to actually make the condition worse. So keep that in mind. ANP and BNP actually reduce overall blood volume and therefore allow the heart to actually start to pump a little more effectively. So book addresses this a little bit. Article does a much better job on addressing these compensation mechanisms. All right, and then that takes us to shock. Now again, if you uh, are, take a look uh, on Moodle, you will find a handout on shock. So I'm really not going to lecture much about it here. What I'd like to point out about what we're dealing with with shock, we've got two main categories. Cardiogenic shock, that's the failure of the heart to pump adequately. Uh, most commonly it occurs from myocardial infarctions because it comes on rapidly. Uh, although heart failures can possibly lead to shock, it's more commonly an MI. In all cases, there's failure to eject blood. You have a drop in blood pressure, hypotension, and significantly decreased afterload. Therefore, I'm sorry, significantly decreased cardiac output. I'm sorry, significantly decreased cardiac output, and afterload is increased. Preload is increased. There's more blood everywhere, but because the heart's not able to contract effectively, it's going to cause the complications of shock. We're not actually going to be able to deliver the blood. All right, so that's cardiogenic shock. That's a pure failure of the heart itself. In circulatory shock, it's a, de uh, a critical decrease in tissue perfusion. In other words, we are not pumping blood effectively, delivering it to the tissue. So it's not just a hypoxemic or hypoxic issue, it's a simply a lack of blood flow altogether. It's not ischemic because ischemic is a term we would really use to say there's a blockage. In this case, there's not a blockage that's going on. These blood vessels simply dilate. They dilate, there's no, there's no tension in the blood vessels, and blood does not get pumped through the body. Okay. Now, the handout will take you through the different, there's uh, three main types of circulatory shock hypovolemic, obstructive, and distributive. Uh, again, the outline takes you through each of those different types, what really is the concern and the issue. Obstructive shock is pretty, um, that's more, that is a little bit more on the ischemic level. Something's blocking the blood flow. Oftentimes it's a damage to a vessel itself, and then because the blood can't flow through it, you're, you've got, you will not have a continued uh, a, a, blood, a tissue perfusion. All right, and then distributive shock actually has three categories underneath it, the neurogenic, anaphylactic, and septic shock, or sepsis. So again, this uh, chart 2120-1, uh, I think it's on page 500 in your book, will take you through a kind of a brief uh, explanation for what, what's hypovolemic, what's obstructive, uh, what's distributive. Uh, again, those are the three main categories, so it gives you a definition there. Uh, so please read through the section of the book. does a really nice job on explaining these processes. And then the comp compensatory mechanisms in shock are real important um, because they're going to uh, take you through what the body does to try and solve the problem. It's an increased sympathetic process that goes on. We're trying to cause vasoconstriction, so the sympathetic um, uh, our autonomic nervous system kicks in. You see RAA pathway kicking in. You see ADH uh, from the hypothalamus. All of these mechanisms are trying to maintain blood volume, blood pressure, trying to get the 
blood to um, flow to uh, engage again or, or start flowing again. Often these compensatory mechanisms fail and in fact as the problem continues and we're not delivering enough blood these mechanisms can actually start to make the problem worse. That increased blood volume that's not going anywhere starts backing up. The increased constriction narrows the area for which blood can actually pass through. So when though it was supposed to increase the blood pressure overall, it starts actually forming a sort of a blockage. So in the initial moments of shock, this is the mechanism to, these are the mechanisms to make things better. But as the condition progresses, if it does not get better, and it often does not, uh, these mechanisms actually lead to worsening problems. And then the complications of shock, uh, um, acute ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome, please be sure you read through that. We will talk about ARDS or ARDS uh, when we do the respiratory system as well. So just be familiar with that, acute renal fa failure. Uh, GI complications that can occur again it's a lack of these are all issues of lack of tissue perfusion the, the kidneys fail because no blood's flowing to them the GI complications occur no blood's flowing there uh, disseminated uh, intravascular coagulation or DIC is a particular problem in the small minute little blood vessels where the blood's not flowing it starts to clot and the vessels, any pressure or any fluid that is behind it starts causing the tears in the vessels and the person literally starts bleeding out from the inside at the small capillaries. This is a particularly difficult problem. Uh, this complication is often not resolved. It is very commonly associated with septic shock and very often leads to death. It's very hard to recover from DIC. And then multiple organ dysfunction syndrome, or MODS, um, is simply a body-wide response. Many organs start to shut down in response to the lack of tissue perfusion. So be sure that you've read through those. Look at the information on the handout. Some of it's there. Some of it's relying on you to go to the book. The book's not terribly complicated in this section on shock. It's a pretty easy read. And for these complications, I'm not looking for deep analysis of them simply do you know what each of them are and why they're occurring with shock and again it's almost in every case we're looking at a decrease in tissue perfusion no blood flowing to the area these things start to occur in the DIC we're really dealing with a clotting uh, problem that occurs because the blood is not flowing so it starts to accumulate and clot together and that takes us through the end of this unit and the end of the material uh, for this third exam.